Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for being here. My name is Penny Wright. I want to welcome you today and to tell you to please feel free during today's talk to help yourself help yourselves to more scones or tea. We were we wildly uh, overestimated on the scones, so really we hope you'll eat up here. Um, no problem. <laughs> Some of you are familiar faces and some of you are not, but we're happy to see all of you and want to invite those of you who are not in our library district to take a November, December newsletter with you if you like. There's actually, we're winding down, I have to say. But we have a few more things happening. And um, if you live outside our district and want to get our newsletter, because we do a lot of programs here for adults, if you join the Friends of the Library for whatever amount you want, and we'll put some little brochures out, you will get our newsletter mailed to you. And it's actually a really good time to join because they do this on an annual basis. So in other words, you're joining in the, at the right time. If you join right now, you can get $10 or $10 million. <laughs> I was going to say we would thank you equally, but that actually wouldn't be true, would it? <laughs> Wait a minute, I'm looking for my introduction, and I, I don't see it. Wait a minute. Let's just, no. Um, I was asking Pat, uh, I was asking Kay, how many times she's been here, because I know she's been here before, and this is her third time here. I met Kay because she owns a home right next to one of my brothers and his family, and one of my sisters and her family. So we've gotten to know her, and she told me today that this is her 30th year being a part-time Southampton resident. So. Wow, that's a big... It's unbelievable given, given how I look, right? Yeah. <laughs> she must have been five years old. Anyway, as, as many of you know, Kay Gardner is a co-founder with Anne Shane of Mason Dixon Knitting, a daily, yes daily, online magazine and shop for knitters. Um, Mason Dixon Knitting's mission is to create an ever-evolving world online and in real life where knitting is celebrated, <laughs> uh, taught, and explored. It is a place of rich community, creativity, curiosity, and laughter, the ultimate rabbit hole for knitters. <laughs> it also publishes the Ma Mason Dixon Knitting Field Guides, a series of little books about the big world of knitting with patterns by beloved designers and stories to inspire the curious knitter. The most recent edition, which is Mason Dixon Knitting Field Guide number 13, is titled Masterclass. Or maybe, the, is that the name of all of them? Okay. No, no, just this one. Oh, this one is called Masterclass. <coughs> it features exuberant color work designs by renowned artist and designer Kathy Fassett. So, we're just so honored today to have Kay Gardner here with us. So, please welcome Kay. Hi, everybody. Um, as always happens when you're going to speak in public, I got a cold 24 hours ago, so that's why I sound like a baritone this morning or this afternoon. So don't hug me as much as you might want to hug me. Um, uh, I just want to say thank you to the library and especially to Penny for inviting me three times now. The other two times I appeared with Anne. I think um, Anne came both times, and it's a long way from Nashville. Um, and this time she's in Nashville because we're having our first, uh, I'm going down there tomorrow, we're having our first ever one day knitting getaway in Nashville and it's on the premises of our office slash warehouse which is a very funky little uh, place. It's a former uh, flour mill in the middle of Nashville uh, and it has a lot of crazy and creative businesses in it, including Mason Dixon Knitting. Uh, one of our neighbors is French Association. Does anybody know French, so French Supply Company? Uh, so Anne is down there getting ready for that, and um, I get to come to the Hamptons. Um, so I, I feel like a lot of you already know about Mason Dixon Knitting. What I was planning to talk about today 
was um, just a little bit for, you know, so that people who don't know Mason Dixon knitting won't feel lost at sea about all of us talking about it. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about Mason Dixon knitting. Um, and from there, I'll move into like a very short little um, presentation that Ann and I call um, Busting the Myths About Knitting. Uh, we, there's a lot of, when you start to think about it, if you're a, a frequent knitter, there's a lot of things that you've heard over the years about knitting that um, they may even seem true to you, but we, we have found that a lot of them aren't. And so, um, you know, I'll talk to you about that and you'll agree with me or disagree with me, but you'll have something to think about. And, um, and I'd also like to leave room for um, some frequently asked questions. Uh, or for you to ask questions. So uh, we get asked a lot of questions, especially now that um, now that Mason Dixon Knitting is publishing every day. Um, the most frequently asked question is, how do you knit so much? How do you knit so fast? So I'll, I'll try to address that. Um, who is this cat? Does everybody know who this cat is? This is Kermit. Um, and Kermit is a declawed tuxedo cat that Anne adopted. He had been declawed before she got him and he was living in a home where they fostered dogs. So he's extremely happy to be living with Anne. <laughs> and um, he literally sits on her um, as she's typing up her post for Mason Dixon Knitting. So uh, who are we? There we are. Um, you recognize one of these people because it's me, and the other one is Anne. And you may notice we are sort of similar. I always say she's taller and younger and thinner, but otherwise we're the same person. Um, this picture was taken, um, it's not the prettiest picture that's ever been taken of us, but we were at our first time this past March at the Edinburgh Yarn Festival, and it was you know, 48 hours of the highest mountaintop knitting festival experience. So I know they're not doing it in 2020, but we have it on good authority. They'll be back in 2021, which leaves us all time to get to Edinburgh. It's, um, I mean, Mason Dixon Knitting, I mean, everything that we believe in and have done since 2003 is about the idea of there being a knitting community. And um, it's, there's many beautiful festivals here in New York. We have the Rhinebeck uh, Festival, um, which I think, and nobody would deny that's the greatest festival that we have, you know, in North America. I think, uh, at least for a big festival, the little ones are really fun too. Um, <clears throat> but we have Rhinebeck, we have Vogue Knitting Live, and Edinburgh is not like either of those two things. Um, it's much more like just a knitting party that never ends. There is a marketplace, so it's a little bit like Vogue Knitting Live or Stitches, but um, all of the vendors are like, so it's, it's really almost like a juried show. Like they have to be people that are selected to be there. Um, so there won't be any, any things that you do not absolutely want to purchase. Um, which I think is one of the nice things about stitches. You know, there's a lot of stuff there I don't want to purchase. Like the iron, the $400 iron um, that you ne can never turn off, um, things like that. But they didn't have anything like that in Edinburgh. And it, it just really, part, partly because it's in Edinburgh, so for us it was very exotic and fun. And um, so that's me. So about Anne. Anne lives in Nashville, Tennessee, and I live in... Uh, on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, and here, um, which is really a wonderful situation. Um, and we met on the internet um, back in the days when I would, you know, somebody that I'd met on the Rowan chat board would be visiting New York, and I'd, be, I'd go have coffee with them, I'd be excited to see them, and my husband would say, call when you get there because we, I don't know if you know if you remember this but when the internet was newer we didn't like to give our real names to people and we were a little worried like were you really a 12 year old boy and not a middle-aged knitter um, 
Uh, and the first time I did that, um, I met a woman from London named Polly Althwaite, who's actually a New Yorker. But um, I met her, and uh, I came home, and I presented him with a jar of marmalade. I said, this is what the scary person did to me. Uh, they gave me a jar of marmalade. She did. See, this is some deep knowledge to know Polly that well. Polly is a girl from New York. She married an, uh, a guy with like one of the most British names ever, Outweight. Um, so um, Anne and I met on the Rowan chat board, and we kind of noticed each other for not being British because Rowan is a British company, and almost all the other people on the site at that time. And there, this was before Ravelry, it was before knitting blogs. Um, I first heard the term knitting blog on the Rowan chat board because some of our British friends were starting blogs about their knitting and Anne and I were emailing each other by this time and I, you know, I said to her, why would anybody do that? <laughs> like, it's so dumb, like who cares, you know, for the daily report on your knitting? And, you know, three to six months later, we had an knitting blog. And, um, and we quickly grasped what was so fun about it. And um, I think it's, you know, it's, it's still what motivates us today is um, the creation of a space where you invite everyone else in and you can do what you want in that space. And the technology has only gotten better. This is what our blog looked like um, before the most recent renovation of our blog. There were, you know, progressively uh, grubbier blogs behind, you know, before this one. And this was this was really a pretty nice renovation. We got the typeface, and you know, it was it was pretty good. But we were frustrated um, by the format of, of a normal blog. And, you know, mostly we were frustrated by the fact that content kind of disappears after a day. Or it disappears as soon as you replace it with something new. And we, um, we had been blogging, we, you know, from 2003 to 2014 or 2015. We kind of did it when we felt like it. Um, it wasn't a business. Uh, we did along the way uh, write a couple of books um, that were... Um, published by Random House. And so in a way, knitting became our job, but it was only a job that we did for six months to a year when we wrote each one of those books. And then we went back to you know, lazy blogging and other things that we had in our lives. But um, around 2014, we were blogging less and less. And it wasn't like we were knitting less and less, but we had just sort of reached a watershed moment of some kind and I had a job, I'm a lawyer by training, and I had a job uh, down in the financial district uh, working for a government agency and I was really quite bored, um, I, can, I can tell you that honestly. And one of the things I did when I didn't have anything to do at work was I looked at a site called Food52, um, which if you know it, it's a, it's a pretty amazing site. And as it happens, it was started by two women um, who had an idea for, and in the world of food, you know, there's already so much stuff on the internet. And what I admired most about it was that it had this sense of being a real place, of being a place where there was a lot of community input, but it was also very beautiful. Um, one of the co-founders of it is Amanda Hester, who was the food critic, probably when she was still in high school, because she's still very young. Um, she was the food critic for the New York Times, so there's also like perfect punctuation and spelling, which Anne used to work in book publishing, I'm a recovering lawyer, that's really important to us. So we really admired these, this site and I kept saying to Anne, we should make Food 52 for knitters. Why don't, I mean, and one of the things we said when we would have this conversation is, well somebody's going to do it because it's a great idea. And the publish, you know, publishing, as you may have noticed, across all kinds of categories, um, publishing has really run into some difficulty. And we thought one of the big publishing houses, like maybe our publisher, would realize we should be doing this on the internet. Um, and nobody did. So I started wheedling in to do it. And um, in 2015, we both quit every, every other thing that we were doing. And we started working full time to um, design the website that we envisioned, which wasn't, we didn't really have anything to copy. 
Um, so we, we literally told the web designers, we want it to be like Food 52 and the New Yorker had a baby. <laughs> and um, so this is what the blog looked like uh, a couple of weeks ago. And one of the, the, the most admirable thing that I loved about Food 52 was, despite how great it was and how beautiful it is, um, if you refresh Food 52 after 30 minutes, the, there will be new stuff. And we have not yet reached every half hour new stuff on Mason Dixon Knitting, but for the last um, more than three years, every morning at 3.30 a.m. national time, we post something new on the site. And it's not because we, you know, sometimes people say, I don't have t enough time to read everything on Mason Dixon Knitting. And, and that's not our intention. It's not our intention that it be like some kind of obligatory uh, reading for people. It's our intention that it be a rabbit hole where you can find something today just to entertain you today about knitting and you can also we have a whole, all these rich categories across the top of the of the blog. Um, the how-to category is just getting deeper and deeper and it's not um, one of the things we also wanted to be free from was the limitations of me and Anne. Um, we like to write about a lot of things and we both love to knit and we're you know really hardcore knitters without being better than average knitters this is how i would describe us um we do it a lot whether we're good at it or not um but uh, there are people and I'm, I'm sure you know a lot of these people who are really good at teaching knitting techniques and uh, so we just started approaching people we admired, um, and I don't have a slide for this, but, oh, that's really nice. Um, we don't have a slide for this, but if you, if you click on contributors, there's now um, close to 50 people who are contributing to Mason Dixon Knitting on a regular basis. Some of them are every month, and some of them are when they feel like it or they have something um, they want to share. But, you know, it, it, that has been one of the delights of doing this, is, is bringing in other people into our world. And, um, and so, anyway, how to is a place we would love if, if, you know, if you're wondering how to do something, browse that category, because um, there's likely some, an article on it now. There, we have great video content on there. And, um, you know, we want it to be a resource for knitters. Anne and I still, both of us still write at least twice a week each for the blog. Whether you want it or not, we're going to do it. Um, but um, the, the bigger article, which we call the big thing of the day, <laughs> um, the big thing of the day is very often um, written by, you know, one of our contributors. Um, one of the reasons I love this particular slide is this, at the top it says, Welcome K Facet. And, um, you know, the day that we, this was a few weeks ago now, when we rolled out the field guide where the designer of our field guide is Kate Facet. And for those of you who have been knitting for a long time and followed Kate's career, it's like, you know, you just got cast in the movie with Cary Grant. You know, it's, um, uh, oops, where's Kate? Oh, we're, we're gonna come to Kate. We like to do fun community things. One of the things that we do now every March when the basketball tournament is boring some of us to death is um, we do this thing called March Mayhem, which is, you know, I'm waiting for the trademark people to come after us. Um, but it's a bracket for knitters, and it starts out with 64 knitting patterns, and through various rounds of voting by the readers, at the end, uh, one, one of those patterns wins. And the idea isn't really, like, I think we all know that knitting, you know, knitting patterns are a matter of taste. So we're not saying it's the best knitting pattern that wins, or even that these are the 64 best patterns of 2018. But what we're trying to do is, is highlight the ones that we think are great, because Knitting is very much now something that, knitwear design is now something that people do independently. And they do it on their own dime and they don't get a regular paycheck. And um, it's the knitwear designer, knitting pattern designers that you think of as um, the big designers, they're not that big. 
Um, ev almost every business in the knitting space is a micro business. Even Barocco is not a big business in, by any stretch of any corporate imagination. So um, it's something that we'd like to remind knitters of. Uh, and this is a way of encouraging people to, to see their work because it's hard sometimes to see everything that's on Ravelry. It's just a fire hose of patterns. And, um, and we do solicit nominations uh, in February before we choose the bracket so that, um, you know, it's not, it's not, it is really me and Anne picking the patterns for sure. But we want to have as much, uh, as much to choose from as possible. And we can't see everything. We, we work at it almost every day. I check hot right now to see if, you know, what's new. And um, I still miss so much. So we do get input. And we would welcome more people doing stuff like this because I think the designers need the support. Um, and that's why there's no free patterns in the bracket because, you know, we want to, we want really direct support of people who are devoting their lives to making knitting fun for us. Um, so these are the, the 64 from March of 2019. So these were all published in 2018. They're all paid patterns and we had various categories. Um, the one that won is that chartreuse sweater in the middle. Um, it's a sweater called Tabuli by Carol Feller, who's an Irish designer. Um, I sure hope she's doing a field guide soon. Maybe that will happen. Um, so this came about like totally independently, but at the same time that we decided to do Mason Dixon knitting, we were like, oh no, it's not a big enough commitment of our time and money to, to make a daily <laughs> website. But we heard that Melanie Fallick, do, you know, does, do people know her name, Melanie Fallick? We heard that she had left her position at Abrams, which is the most beautiful uh, publisher of illustrated books. And she had been there for like 10, 15 years with her own imprint. And the most beautiful knitting and, and sewing books that you've ever seen are, were all published with Melanie as the creative director or the editor. Um, and we heard that she was leaving that position to just reevaluate her life and that she was looking for uh, freelance work. And we just, I drove up to Beacon um, to ask Melanie if she would work with us. And we didn't know what we were going to work on. And within an, a couple of months, we figured out that the best use of Melanie and the, you know, the most exciting thing that we could do was do was you know participate in a dying industry by publishing print books. Um, <laughs> it just seemed like a really great idea. I mean, it, I'm I'm making a joke about it, but it really did seem like a good idea to us because we, as much as we loved publishing books with 30 patterns in them, um, it, we were really glad that we got to do that. We, we get it. In the age of Ravelry, knitters don't want to buy a book with 30 patterns in it. And um, that's just a reality. And the sooner that those of us who are trying to serve knitters wake up to that reality and react to it, the better off we'll all be. Um, I think, I think the, the print magazines are struggling because it's, it's an attention span thing. Um, when I was knitting in the 90s and early 2000s, I would literally go to the Barnes & Noble just to see. I knew there was no new inner weave for another month and a half, and I knew there was no new Vogue, but I was thinking, maybe they'll have one of those weird German magazines, or, you know, I would just be hungry for, uh, you know, some new content. But those ages, that age is past. Um, knitters can now just log into Ravelry, or go on to Mason Dixon Knitting or another, you know, there's many places now that knitters can go for much more frequent um, knitting content. So, but we still love books. Anne used to work in book publishing. She's very much a lover of the object of a book. I am too, not as much as her. She's like, she's really specific about fonts. You don't want to send her something that is not in the correct font. Um, ask me how I know. <laughs> but, um, but so we thought, you know, just as an experiment, because everything that we're doing for the last three years is really an experiment, um, we thought we would 
try to publish a series of small books and um, books that would fit in your knitting bag, books that had an ebook edition so that people who, who don't, who, people who, who want to just buy their patterns on Ravelry, period, um, can still participate. Um, and so we just published the third one, and that's the big news. Um, and the thir the 13th one, and that's with, with Kay Facet, who um, we met, we had met him before, um, and even had dinner with him one time, but we were fangirling so hard that we, you know, that was all that really happened, was <laughs> we got to just be nervous about having dinner with Kay. He was really wonderful. Um, but. Melanie has edited several of Kate's books, including his autobiography. So back in February, she said, um, that's him. I told you he looked like Harry Grant. Uh, you know, she said, oh, Kate is in, you know, in Pennsylvania with Liza Pryor Lucy, uh, who he collaborates on all of his quilting work with. And I'm going down to see them. Do you want to go? <laughs> And it was like the following week, and she said, oh, I just thought Kay would want to go. And Anne was like, I want to go. <laughs> so Anne, it was the only time in our long relationship that Anne came to New York and flew back the same day. But we did go to Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, and spend the day with Kay. And we had it together enough to ask him to work with us on a field guide, and he said yes. Um, one of the reasons we're really excited about is that uh, about working with him is we're super fan girls. There's never been anybody like him, and there never will be anybody like him in knitting. And it's not even really about whether you want to knit what he's designing. In my opinion, it's a lot of knitters will say, you know, he uses too many colors. He does, um, you know, he all that intarsia. He really loves it. He's a painter, so he loves. Intarsia, where you can make shapes and forms in the knitting, and he he and he doesn't care whether it's difficult because he's an artist, and if you like it, you'll do it. And he and he has an attitude of things not being difficult um, because I guess they're not difficult for him. <laughs> but um, he really feels, and this this is this really dovetails with one of our beliefs, uh, which was in our very first book, which is. No project is too ambitious if you crave that result enough. And, um, and he's the epitome of that. If you want to make this, okay, this is how you do it. You get yourself 37 colors and you follow this chart. And then at the end, you have one of the most amazing textiles in Western civilization. You know, it, it seems like a good deal, right? Um, but we kind of felt like, you know, we knew what Cave would do for us. Uh, in terms of you know honoring us by working with us, but our question is, what are we going to do for Cave? And um, it it seemed really clear to both of us that in the age of Ravelry, uh, his work was not getting the attention that it deserved. Uh, and uh, he doesn't uh, participate in the internet, you know, and um, and he mostly designs for Rowan. Uh, He's been in every issue of Rowan magazine for the you know since the 90s, so one through 66 and counting. But um, when you, if you look him up on Ravelry, you'll see you know a few people posting the projects that they made in their notebooks. But you, it's very hard to access him uh, without going you know going to used bookstores and and becoming you know a real Rowan head. So we thought. You know that knitters need to know about Cave, and that they also need to catch on to his spirit of joy, and and that his spirit of it's not that easy, just it's not that hard, just do it. And so we we asked him to go back to um, the kind of playfulness and the roots of what he's doing, and we specifically said, let's not make it hard. Let's you know let's do it with stripes and with uh, stripes that are solid, stripes that are patterned. And then he started sending the swatches and it was just, you know, it was just amazing. So this is one of the patterns in the book, which is, um, you know, it is a stripe, but the stripe has a pattern in it that 
uh, Cave Calls Coins. Um, Did you stand under the light? Sure. I have, oh, um, and um, I passed it around, but it's, it's still in progress, yeah. so um, feel free to come. Um, it's the, and this it looks even more colorful than than ten colors, but it's it's ten colors. And I play I'm playing a game with myself of not repeating any combination of two colors as the background or the the coins. And it's it's it, you memorize it within the first repeat. It's it, he's not kidding that it, it really is easy. Um, but so uh, if anybody wants to ask me questions about cake, I, I could talk about him a lot, <laughs> but um, he really is everything that you think he is, um, and we're, we were a little worried that, you know, all of our sweater knitters would kind of go, eh, too many colors, but that hasn't happened. I mean, it's, there is truly a blossoming on Mason Nixon knitting of people knitting, um, cave and and playing with them like the shapes are all there's no there's no shaping there's no increases or decreases it's just very easy uh, once you get playing with his colors um, oh I'm going to show you some of them the, that's the hardest thing you're going to think I'm a liar now that you see that but um, each one of those stripes is a different chart and you can do all of the charts or you can do none of the charts and just do stripes um, Anne is making one of these where she's kind of almost choosing a chart at random, but the sample is, and see there, the garter stitch one is, uh, it doesn't really get any easier than that unless you were going to make it all one color so that you wouldn't have to, so that you wouldn't have to weave in the ends. Um, but none of, none of the pattern, none of the charts are, um, well not none, but most of the charts are less than 10 rows long, so it's, it's just, um, if you're going to access his work, this is, I think, the most accessible point. And the thing that's really good is that, like, you could say that, you know, these, putting these constraints on Kaif were kind of maybe dumbing him down a little bit, because if you've seen some of his work, you know, he'll have a striped background and then a giant flower you know, and so you're changing every row. You're changing the color of the background, and between the flower motifs, you have to keep changing the stripes in the background. That's hard. I I did it just out of my devotion to him, but it was the kind of knitting I could only do it once a week when I was like really caffeinated. You know, um, uh, and this is not like that. I mean, it's uh, it's enjoyable knitting. Um, you know. So now we're going to talk knitting philosophy, but you can always ask me questions about CAFE um, at any time. Um, this is kind of a short version of this because we have a lot of myths that we like to bust, but we don't have enough time to go through that many. Um, so I, I picked the ones that I thought, you know, the experienced knitters of the Hamptons would probably relate to the most. Um, especially now that we run Mason Dixon Knitting as a daily website and a shop, and we're selling people kits, and we're selling people patterns in these little books. Um, we get questions from knitters about patterns, and um, some of, you know, I, we both really believe this, and we both live this. Um, even if it's our own pattern, we sometimes, you know, often change the pattern. Um, patterns are really like recipes, uh, you know, you could maybe the first time you make Coco Van or something, you follow the recipe, and when Julia Child tells you to put an X in the bottom, you know, cut a little X in the bottom of every pearl onion, and you think to yourself, I wonder why she's asking for us to do that. But I'm going to do it because I love Julia Child and I want to make it exactly the way she says. But by the fifth time you've made Coco Van, you're just throwing the onions in. Yeah. And um, or you're taking out the ingredients that you don't like, you know, and that's the way patterns, you know, for, for maximum enjoyment, I think that's the attitude that you should have toward a pattern. Um, and there would be a lot less ripping out of things that are just different instead of wrong. Um, this is a pattern from uh, Field Guide number five, which is called Sequences, which features Cecilia Campo Chiaro's sequence knitting technique. 
um, which is a very revolutionary technique, uh, very simple. Um, it's all knits and pearls, and they are in sequences, as the name suggests. But you get all these uh, textures that almost are generated automatically, like uh, like computer code almost. Uh, and so sometimes you'll be working a, a sequence, and at the start you don't know what the fabric is going to look like. Um, the simple ones, like knit two, purl two, that's a sequence. But if you do it over an odd number of stitches, you will start to get some textures. <laughs> Uh, so that that's a wrap. That's the pattern that's in the book. I'm wearing that sample. Um, I stole it. Um, I'm, we're not supposed to do that. We're supposed to keep the samples nice and clean, but I couldn't help it. Um, but Anne took that pattern, which is really just a sampler of sequence knitting stitches, and made it into a blanket. Um, she just worked in using log cabin construction, she just started knitting. Each block was a different sequence. And it's, I'm sorry this is such a close up, but it's a beautiful close up, but it, it's a, a truly amazing blanket that I think it, it's not the pattern. It's not even close to being the pattern that was written, but it's the thing that the pattern made her think of. And if you, um, if you start thinking that way about knitting, it can really expand the fun that you have with it. Um, one of the reasons we we ever designed anything was because um, neither of us is a designer or particularly enjoys writing knitting patterns. Is but the reason we sometimes still do it is when you when you think of something and you can't find a pattern for it. And for for me, that was always blankets. I didn't. I still don't think there's enough blanket patterns. Um, there's a lot of blanket patterns that are just like a giant swatch of the same stitch over and over, and that is really hard for me to take on. But patterns with like interesting, playful things in them, I think we need more. Um, and Anne made this one. Um, this is also from Cecilia's Field Guide number five, and that's probably the most most popular kit and pattern that we've ever had. Um, and it's because of the yarn. It's a this is knit to that texture is formed by knit two, purl two over an uneven number of stitches. And it's knit on the bias also, which gives it a pretty nice texture. So when you first look at it, sometimes even you know really experienced knitters will look at that fabric and say, I don't know how, how, how it was done. But it's knit two, purl two. Um, and the yarn is uh, Freya, which is a, um, a gradient dyed yarn that has really slow changes. So it's either the pleasure or the torture of knitting it is sometimes you're just going like, I'm waiting for it to turn blue. It's going to turn blue. It's going to turn blue. Okay, maybe tomorrow it's going to turn blue. Um, this is a pattern uh, from field guide number three, which is called Wild Yarns. And the idea there was to, um, everybody has these crazy hand-dyed yarns because you'll go to a shop and they'll have one and you just can't resist it. It looks so pretty in this game. And then you get home and you're like, what am I doing with this? Um, especially if it's not a sock weight yarn, you're going to have a challenge. So we, we based this on a, a sweater that a, a friend of ours just knit um, because she wanted to use a crazy skein of yarn and still have a sweater that you know, wasn't crazy the whole way. And uh, it's called the easel pullover. But I've never made one of these. And the, part of the reason I've never made one is because Anne made three. <laughs> um, and you'll you'll notice that Anne made it backwards because mm -hmm. she fell in love with the with the yarn that was supposed to be the accent yarn and and this is really unusual for Anne who wears almost exclusively gray and taupe um, but she just fell in love with this yarn and she's she wears all of these sweaters she has duplicate stitched MDK our logo on one of them so that she can wear it at festivals. But, you know, this may not be your sweater, um, but it j I think it just demonstrates that you can, you can do it how you want to do it. And um, so this is something that we hear a lot, um, that things are too hard. And um, our knitting is never really that hard because we're kind of the queens of 
knit, of easy knitting. Um, we call it sometimes knitting below your skill level. Um, and But by the same token, it's almost painful to me to think that somebody would not knit something that they really love because they think it's too hard. And um, you've probably heard this a million times, but I want you to really absorb it, that it's all knit and pearl. And it's knit and pearl, and the really hard thing is following directions and focusing. So that's why I knit so many square things, you know, because I don't, even, you know, a basic pullover like the one I just showed you, when you, you know, when you get up here, you have to start focusing because you don't, you want the armhole to go in the way armholes go. And I don't always have the energy for that. And I, I don't think that makes me a bad knitter. It's just the reality of life. At nine o'clock at night when you're watching TV, you don't want to keep turning the light on and looking at the, at the pattern. Um, but anyway, the point is I don't want, I, I, would, I, I would preach to everyone not to not knit something because it has a technique in it that you don't like. like. One of the reasons I didn't knit socks until we published a field guide this year on socks is, you know, I have a lot of excuses or reasons. Um, one of them was just that I thought, oh, once you, once you get into knitting socks, it looks like you only knit socks. Um, it seems to have a very strong power over people. And since I'm susceptible to that already, I thought, oh, I could, I could maybe not knit socks. But the other reason, probably the more honest reason, was something called Kitchener Stitch. Um, it, it, again, it's not hard, but I hate things that you have to look up every time you do them. Um, it just makes me discouraged in some way. And so I would, when I needed to Kitchener Stitch something in a non-sock project, I would find a way not to have to Kitchener stitch it. Like this, I, I'm, I love the three needle bind off. Does it make a big fat seam sometimes where you don't want one? Maybe, but it, it closes the hole without looking up Kitchener stitch. <laughs> and um, so I think, uh, and then, so we published a field guide on uh, socks. And so as part of my job, I had to knit socks and I, have now knit about seven or eight pairs of socks just in this year and I saw a video which had nothing to do with us by um, Laura Lee Beltman does everybody know who she is she has this we, we put it on our site so it's in our how-to section she has this short video on YouTube how to memorize the Kitchener stitch and it I learned how to do it from that watching that video like two times three times and it's it's so freeing to never have to look it up again you know I just get my tapestry needle and I know how to do it so that's very satisfying and it proves my point that you know you shouldn't avoid something because you think it's hard if you really want to do it um, this is an ex just an example of something that looks hard but isn't. Um, if you are a lace knitter, that won't look hard to you. If you are a non-knitter, that looks amazing to you. And it's really just uh, yarn over knit two together and there's a lifting of a stitch over. Uh, we see where it looks kind of like a cable, you kind of slip a stitch over. But um, this is something, does every some of you will recognize this pullover. It's by a Japanese designer who is the darling of Ravelry right now. Her name is Junko Okamoto. And she designs these really graphic sweaters. And this is just the yoke of one. The way the pattern reads, this is also going to the other point about you don't have to follow the pattern. The way the pattern reads, this is stranded color work. And over those big distances, that is just kind of a buzz kill, really. You know, it's a lot of catching of floats. And Anne wanted the sweater, and she didn't want to do that, so she duplicate stitched it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it took some figuring out. Like, you know, arguably it would have been easier to do it the way the designer said to do it. 
but it's it's kind of like a pick your poison thing and Anne preferred the poison of having to chart having to divide that yoke up into four sections so that she could uh, follow a chart to duplicate stitch it and it looks exactly like uh, the original this is like when you're totally not following any pattern whatsoever <laughs> Um, but it is a pattern, um, it's, uh, I can't remember what we called them, but it was in our second book. It was socks, uh, I think they were called the Stephen Colbert socks. Yeah. Um, uh, but it's, it's where you just cable whenever you feel like it. And um, Anne ended up loving doing this so much that she made a sweater doing this technique. And there's, you know, there's some things, like if you start cabling too much, the whole thing kind of draws in and gets very gnarly. So you have to pay a little attention, but it is really fun and it is a wild looking sweater. Um, this is stranded color work, probably the most easiest that you would ever do. It's called Kiki Mariko. Uh, we did it as a rug that you felted after you hit it in the round, you then felted it and then steaked it on the theory that a felted steak was a lot less scary to cut. Um, but the, the, the color work on it is so easy. Um, there's, here's a big one. Um, this is when I really start preaching. Because um, one thing people will say a lot when they're like leaving a comment about how beautiful something is, they'll say, I'm going to do it after I finish the 16 things that I have not finished yet. And um, I'm all for people finishing things. But... I do think that we have a tendency um, as people, but especially as women, um, I think there's something about our upbringing as, as young women, that we have this sense of everything is a competition and everything is our job. And knitting is not any of our jobs. It's not even my job. And um, it's, if you, if you want it to have a lot of joy for you, sometimes you're just gonna cast on something impetuously. I think it's important to bear in mind that you probably will finish almost everything that you really want. Um, I've sometimes left a blanket for years. Uh, the one that I'm putting the eye cord on right now, I knit that like four or five years ago. And it was the size of a baby blanket when it got done and I didn't have a baby. And I was like, oh, I'll put the eye cord on it later. And you know, it, it took the baby making himself known and me wanting to give a baby blanket that now I'm, I'm doing this on the jitney, um, putting the eye cord on. But, um, so you, you probably will finish a lot of things. Some of the things that you have sitting there, like a sweater that has only one sleeve let to go, one, I think, you know, like this could be a whole book by, you know, um, Marie Kondo, you know, really. It's like, you need to talk to that sweater. You probably don't really want that sweater anymore. And, um, and so it's really hard. It's called the sunk cost theory of we don't like to give on some, up on something that we've spent a lot of time working on. But really, the path toward joy is to just, number one, recognize that it isn't lost time because it was time that you spent knitting what you love to do. And if you don't want to finish it anymore, it's still yarn, you know? So just get it back to its elemental state of yarn and make something else. Or um, if, if you really don't even want the yarn anymore, there's always somebody that wants good yarn. Um, I never have any trouble getting rid of my, you know, old, in my unfinished sweater yarn. Um, so I just, I just put this out there as a proposition that um, if, 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 cause, cause it happens to me too, where I'll look around and I'll, and there'll be like a little sad pile of knitting everywhere though. <laughs> and I'll start feeling bad like I haven't done the dishes or something, you know? Like it just feels like morally wrong that I have all these unfinished things. And it really isn't, you know? Like I, this is my hobby, I do it for love and joy and um, I'll finish when I'm darn good and ready. Um, and you get some nice surprises sometimes. Anne had this sweater and she, she claims that it was in three successive levels of plastic bag because she was so angry at it when she messed up the yoke decreases that, you know, 
one plastic bag wasn't enough. It had to go inside another one and then another one. <laughs> and when she finally dug it out, um, partly because it's our business and this is one of our designs and I wanted her to finish the sweater, um, she had almost like an instant sweater. She had to figure out her decreases, which I guess wasn't easy, but she had only a few hours left of knitting. And there's probably a few items in your plastic bags that if you wanted to finish them now, they'd be done. You know? <coughs> so you might get, if, if, if you still do want that sweater, you're almost there. Um, I really don't know why this picture, oh, I know why this picture is there. Um, this is a great gift to knit because you can knit it very fast. It's called the Appleseed Mitts um, by Thea Coleman. But um, this is what we call in the professional knitting business a palette cleanser. Like sometimes you just need a break from what you're knitting. And the best break is to knit something else. Um, and I do this all the time. I knit little things. Uh, sock knitting is good for that too. When you're kind of vamping and you, have, you can't make up your mind about your next major project, or you're just sick of everything else you're knitting, I, this is my advice. Knit something little and cute that you can finish and get that sense of accomplishment. Um, I don't know why this picture is there, but it's pretty, isn't it? Um, we're kind of winding down, I think. This is Anne knitting with all the colors of Euroflex and linen that we have, just because she wanted to. Um, okay, how many people agree with this, that garter stitch is boring? Leave. <laughs> um, you know, I love garter stitch, so um, I'm just going to show you a few pictures to show you, you know, what I think is so beautiful about it. Um, these are little cloths, we just, we didn't call them dish cloths because they could be any kind of cloth, but if you, these are in field guide number four, log cabin. Um, I would have to say that when somebody showed me log cabin 20 years ago as a knitting technique, it just changed everything for me. And I'm not saying that log cabin itself would be life changing for everyone, but uh, it is, um, there's probably some other technique in knitting that will be your life changing uh, technique. It might be sequence knitting. Um, it might be K facets, crazy color work. For me, it was log cabin. I always come back to it. Sometimes I leave it for long periods of time because I'm knitting all the stuff from our field guides and stuff. But when I come back to it, I always just feel like it's so fun. Um, it's you have to have a little sense of adventure. Um, you have to, you know, have a mind that likes to think about where you how you would arrange your your strips of color. But as you can see just from this little picture, there's a lot of different ways to, to arrange those strips of color. But you're only knitting with one color at a time and it's all garter stitch. And so it's the alt, and there's a little bit of counting, but the numbers always make sense because, um, because of the way that garter stitch works. One stitch equals two rows and it always does and it always will. Um, so, but see this is garter stitch. And that is also Log Cabin. This is Karen Templer's free pattern called the Log Cabin Mitts. And, you know, all she did was add that little gusset. It's, that is a Log Cabin square, like one of those cloths, that's been folded over and seamed and a little gusset added for the thumb. And they're just so darling. Um, I mean, this is a pattern from our first book that we adapted, and um, I still make those for newborns, but only for newborns for some reason. They just want to be on a newborn. Yeah. Um, this is the blanket that I'm knitting right now. Um, it's called Mitered Squares, or Mitered Crosses, and all the proceeds of this pattern go to uh, Mercy Corps, which is a relief organization. But um, this is garter stitch, but it's, it's never boring because the, the central cross is formed by, by knitting four miters and you knit each miter onto the edge of the preceding one until you've got the whole four, crop, you know, four sections done. And then you just you frame it in log cabin. 
And so it's just this really satisfying little construction project for each one of the blocks. And you can, you know, do it to suit your personality. Like, I like to make all the centers and then make all the frames. Some people make the whole block and then they make the next block. Um, and then they're all joined by three needle bind off, which is a really great technique for blankets. Um, and, you know, that's just, how could you not like that, you know? This is, you know, garter stitch on Noro. Um, and when you're done knitting the garter stitch blanket, you put a garter stitch border on it, right? Um, and that this is really our main rule about knitting. It's not fun. I just heard a, a chef Thomas Keller on a podcast um, talking about um, you know he makes very, he's known for very elaborate cooking. But one of the things he he tells all the people that work for him is if it's hard, you're doing it wrong. And um, that's that's not a put down. It's a call for you to think about it. Like. Okay, how could I make this so that it's not hard, so that it seems natural and logical to do it this way? Um, and that's how I feel about knitting. If it's if it's not fun, I wouldn't be doing it. So it has to be fun at all times. Um, so questions? <laughs> Thanks a lot for listening to me. When did you learn to knit? Um, I learned to knit in the Campfire Girls. Any other former Campfire Girls here? No? Yeah. The Campfire Girls are always the stepdaughters to the Girl Scouts. Um, I was a Campfire Girl and I had a Campfire Leader named Mrs. Kilpatrick who chain smoked and did crafts. And, um, <laughs> And in those days, you know, you could have 14 little girls over to your house and just smoke the whole time they were there. <laughs> I mean, now, like, if, if some kid came over to your house for a play date and mama's in the kitchen just smoking and drinking coffee, you'd get turned in, wouldn't you? Uh, and she was great. And she, we did so many fun crafts because my mom was a, um, was and still is. A kind of a neat freak and so I never got to do any fun stuff like that at home like I was always being cleaned up and um, and so we made uh, those slippers those garter stitch slippers with the big pom-poms and, um, and I learned how to knit I think Mrs. Kilpatrick finished my slippers for me because I don't really have a good memory of that but that's how I learned I didn't knit again for a long time because again my mother was not very attentive about the craft supplies uh, but I when I was in my 30s in New York I was walking by a yarn shop and I was just curious mm -hmm. and you know the rest is history I, I don't there have probably been very few days since then that I have not knit every day so and I remembered how to knit from being a kid so mm -hmm. I have a question here um, is knitting catching on among men at all um, I don't know I wouldn't say it's catching on I think that's almost a little bit like um, sometimes people um, usually not knitting people, but you know, people who are asked looking for a quote for some article or something will call us and they'll say things like, "Knitting is really hot right now," you know, and you want to say, "Knitting is thousands of years old, and it's only hot to you because you never heard of it before." But there, I think it's probably ever more acceptable for men to knit. And um, I was interviewed on this podcast a couple weeks ago by. Um, uh, a guy who is married to a knitter who, who wrote an amazing book about it called The Knitting Circle. Um, it's, it's a really, it's a novel, but it's based on her life and it's about um, how, how knitting saved her life after the loss of a, her five-year-old daughter. And, um, and he said because of what knitting means to her, he wants to learn how to knit. And I thought that was really interesting because um, I know that all the men I know that knit, you know, they're really into it. But for, for a guy who's just sort of an, a spectator of knitting, I thought it was interesting that he didn't just brag about his wife knitting. He said, I want to learn how to knit. And um, I, think, I think more and more men are knitting. One of the things I've heard, um, and I think it's true, is that historically, when knitting was, before the Industrial Revolution, when knitting was a trade, because stockings had, there was no other way of making them than hand knitting them. Um, women didn't knit 
it was the trade was for men, and uh, um, so I think that's interesting too. I mean, it's the way of the world, isn't it? That if there's a good living to be gone from it, women don't get to do it. Um, but I think one of the reasons that there's all these cliches about knitting now is is because it became a leisure craft. You know, it it became the kind of thing that those women in Jane Austen novels do, and. Um, it, it lost some respect, or it was trivialized for that. But there's a regular Wednesday night knitting group at my local yarn store, Knitty City, and for years. I love it. Um, <laughs> I, um, one of the interesting experience I had one time when I was not as experienced a knitter as I am now, I was knitting a baby sweater, and it, and it, it needed... It, the pattern said to crochet the button band and make those little loop buttonholes, and I was like, well, I don't know how to do that. But I didn't have anybody to show me, and I just thought, well, let me see if the way to crochet is the way I think you would crochet. And it was. It worked. You know, I mean, it's, I think it's very, it should be very intuitive for knitters and crocheters to kind of understand what the other is doing. I, I learned, I did take a class to learn granny squares because I really, one of my favorite like graphic motifs and I I didn't really love the motion the the, the wrist motion um, I, I and I, it's probably just a muscle memory thing I so I have a few granny square blankets that I swapped knitting for so that's my love of crochet I don't think there should be any bad blood between knitters and crochet. <laughs> and I, I know that there's there is some, you know, like there there is this perception of a of a rift. We used to make jokes about that, and we realized that some people were were serious when they said things like, you know, oh, it's crochet, you know, and we're like, we were just joking because we love crochet, so. Yes, <laughs> multi-craft tool. So you do both? Yeah, I do both. I like most of the stitch more now, but I do a lot of afghans by the square, and I always crochet them together. I mean, I think one valid thing to say against crochet is it takes so much more yarn. Um, but if it's, you know, I, I totally get why people like to do it. It's beautiful. Um, and it's fast depending on the stitch. So everybody get a scone, and thank you again, Penny, for having me. Anybody wants to feel this or examine it? Okay, that was a wonderful, a wonderful talk, and even though I don't knit, I wish I did. I'll teach. I wish I did. Thank you all for coming. We'll see you again. Maybe we'll, if you think of more knitting related topics in the next year or so, maybe she'll come out again. Anyway, thank you, Kay. Thank you so much.